you would turn with me to the book of Colossians, I'm going to read out of one of the prison letters, one of the letters that Paul wrote while he was in prison in Rome. He's writing, uh, as far as we know, the only time he's writing to a church that he did not himself plant. But he's answering questions and challenges that one of his protégés brought to him while he was in prison in Rome in this church that uh, his protégé had planted. I'm going to start at verse 15, and I'm going to read through verse 20, if you'll follow with me. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, invisible and visible, whether thrones or dominions or rule, rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven. This is the word of God. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word and the, the guidance that it gives us in our life and the, the truth that it reveals to us. I want to thank you for the spirit and his promise to interpret all that you have recorded for us so that we learn to understand it and to apply it. I thank you for the privilege we have of binding together under Christ as his body to equip each other to live it. I pray that this week these encouragement and the strength that we gain from our fellowship with each other and with you will reflect well on you to a watching world. I pray that as this congregation works together to prepare outreaches and inward reaches and worship services that will give you glory, that you will receive the credit for what we do. And so we bring them all to you in prayer, knowing that without your involvement, we've just produced what human beings can. We, Father, long to see something more, something more than what we can create under our own strength. We ask you to guide us to it. In Jesus' name, amen.
was beautiful. I always appreciate those music groups and people who can sing and uh, apologize to those of you in the back pew who had to listen to me sing this morning. Uh, some of those hymns were powerful for me as well, and sometimes I get a little carried away at that point, but uh, music does speak to us, doesn't it? Um, at this point, we can go ahead and dismiss our kids for Children's Church. Uh, we do have a uh, children's lesson that's a little more appropriate for their age group. And we also have a, a, a what they used to call a diaper roll for those younger ones. There's a, some ministry back there for them and for nursery age. So um, please take advantage of that. Of course, we support parents who want their children to stay in the sanctuary for the, the grown-up lesson. And I try to be aware of who's in the room when I have to make vocabulary choices as well. So... Uh, before we look into our lesson today, let's um, take just a moment and pray. Uh, Father, we we're thankful for the privilege of looking into your word, but it's it's a big job, Father, and it's so easy to go astray when we look into your word, and uh, we're so dependent on your Spirit guiding us. As we pick up this very weighty task, we ask that you'll speak to each person in this room in a, a unique and special way that meets our needs where we are today and prepares us for the needs we'll have in the future. As we look into your word, Father, we know that we're looking into truth, and we ask that that truth will speak to us as you want it to. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, we're going to start a brand new series today. Uh, this year, if you haven't noticed, I'm speaking primarily in series. I tend to flop back and forth between that year to year. One year, I'll speak pretty much from one book, um, breaking books down into individual parts. And then the next year, I'll speak on topics. And this, this year, I'm speaking on topics relating to discipleship. And now I want to look at uh, what it's like to live by the book. In other words, I want to spend a couple of weeks here looking at the influence that Scripture has on the individual disciple. And today I want to look at the center of it all, the, the, the key center of the book as a whole, Jesus. And now when I prepared for this, I realized that there is some possibility for some confusion and being me, I went looking for illustrations of confusion, and I ran into an old skit that I really enjoy, I've always thought was absolutely hilarious. Some of you are familiar with Abbott and Costello, and you may even know what I'm about to talk about. You know, Abbott and Costello, one of their most famous skits was Who's On First? If you're not familiar with it, they're... The, the, Costello is playing a news writer, a sports writer for a local magazine, and his new team is in town for the weekend, and, and Abbott plays the manager of that team, and, and Costello asks for the roster. He wants to know who's playing on which base or which position in, in the field, and uh, Abbott explains to him, you know, they give some of these guys some strange nicknames. In our team, who's on first, what's on second, and I don't know is on third, and some of you can already imagine what's coming, because uh, Costello was a master of two things, the improv and physical comedy. And he gets really confused and really frustrated because he can't figure out who's playing on which base, or even if anybody's playing on some of the bases. And by the time you're done, or at least if you're like me, you're just rolling on the floor because it's absolutely hilarious to watch Costello get more and more and more frustrated. We sometimes, when we get confused, we get frustrated. And that's why we spend so much time uh, as individuals trying to make our lives clear. We spend time focusing on uh, how we're going to spend our time and what we're going to work towards in our life. We work towards um, trying to be well-organized, trying to be uh, goal-oriented, we, have, we take the time to decide, you know, how much time am I going to put into physical fitness? Or how much time am I going to spend earning an income? Or what am I going to do to earn an income? Uh, many of us will get to a point in life where we have to look at our emotional well-being. And we have to decide if what we're doing is emotionally healthy or socially healthy. Do we have a good relationship? Do we invest enough in our relationships so that they're healthy? And as most of us in this room are believers in Jesus Christ, we probably put some effort into um, becoming spiritually strong as well. And we know that if we let confusion get into our life, it's going to detract from those goals. It'll result in wasted time and effort and resources. It will frustrate us just as bad as it frustrated Costello not being able to get his answers. And in worst case scenarios, it can actually lead to failure. So we spend a great deal of time deciding what's important in our life. And I, I'm going to propose today that the, the real question isn't who's on first. But the real question that a believer needs to settle is who comes first? And if we're reading the scripture, we will find that Jesus comes first. Now, I'm going to explain that to you here in just a moment. But uh, what I want to explain about the passage that we're going to look at, which is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, if you're not already turned there. This is the classic passage on the doctrine of preeminence. That's a $50 word for this is the place you typically would go when you want to find out how important Jesus really is. 
When people stop and ask me in the hallway or send me texts and say, why do why you spend so much time focusing on Jesus? Then I would take them to this passage and say, this is the key passage. There are others, but the key passage that tells us that Jesus is preeminent. And this passage tells us that in two ways. The first thing it tells us is that Jesus is supreme in all of creation. That's the first three verses in this passage. The way Paul says it is, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Now, I have the benefit of having spent all week trying to process this passage. And the key to this entire passage is one word that is repeated twice. And it's repeated the first time in this first verse. The word firstborn. And if this is... uh, If this seems like I'm camping on this one too much, I'll explain to you first why I'm doing that. Because there are are misunderstandings of what Scripture teaches about Jesus and His origin. There are a number of um, false teachings out there that say that Jesus was created, not always existent. That there was a period of time that Jesus didn't exist. And if you read the whole Bible, all together, you can find many passages where it describes Jesus as having been eternal. Now, sometimes we think of eternal as the future, but when the Bible talks about eternal, it talks about both in the future and in the past. As far back in the time as you could go, Jesus was already there. But when we as 21st century readers read that term firstborn, we might make the mistake of jumping to the conclusion that Jesus was Created by God at some subsequent time after whatever. It's a difficult word to translate. In fact, it's a difficult word to pronounce, so I wrote it down. It's prototakos. Like most Greek words, it is a combination of two uh, primary words pushed together. Proto. It's a word that we, we even use in our culture today, proto. It means to have come before. Uh, we use it in our, in our culture uh, a lot of times for things that have been invented. And the first production of something invented is called a prototype. And I, I thought about this this week. If I, if I were to pick up this clicker that I use for PowerPoint... This may have actually been, I don't know if it is, but it may have actually been the very first PowerPoint clicker of its design to come off of the assembly line. Probably not, but it might have been. But that would not make this the prototype. Somewhere in somebody's vault is a precursor to this. Something that the engineers got together and and fitted together and said, well, we want to make it do this, and we want to make it do that, and we want to make it do the other thing. And as they experimented with it, they realized they didn't need all of those functions, so they didn't put all those functions into the production model. That precursor they call a prototype, and I would imagine that that prototype is in somebody's vault somewhere, under lock and key, uh, very heavily insured so that they can go back to it if they want to make a new design. They can go back to the prototype and design a new device from it. That's what proto means. It means something that comes before. Takos means somebody who fills a function. It means somebody who is brought forth for a purpose. And what the... what. Paul is trying to say here is not that Jesus was created subsequent to something, but that Jesus' position has a precursor to it. He is the precursor to all function. That he is the one who has a privileged position of primacy. That's That's a pastor's way of remembering a term. 
a privileged permission of having come before all things. And what did he come before? Paul gives us a pretty succinct list here. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Get this, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Those are Paul's code words for angels and demons. He uses those repeatedly in the book of Ephesians in the same way to describe what early Greeks would have called uh, demigods. The demons and the angels that work in our world for the benefit of their side of right and wrong. And Jesus has preeminence over all of them. And we should see Jesus as having, not having a particular beginning in time, but as time began to have authority and rank over them. He goes on from there and tells us the second way that Jesus has supremacy, uh, supremacy in redemption. Verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn. There's that word again, same word. The firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might have be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the body, by the blood of his Christ, his cross. Uh, Jesus, I thought about saying it a, different, a little different way. I thought about saying that Jesus has supremacy in, in resurrection. But Paul is speaking of something just a little bit broader than that. Not, not a great deal, but just a little bit broader than that. It, Jesus was the first one resurrected. And because of his resurrection, we have the hope and the future that we will be resurrected. In fact, we, we symbolize that hope, when we put our trust in Jesus, we, we have a baptism ceremony where a person gets to say, for me, I have, the old self has died and been buried and been resurrected, a new creation in Jesus Christ. But Paul talks m about more than that. He talks about reconciliation as well and how Jesus in that resurrection was beginning the process of making our relationship with God, right. That's what reconciliation is. It's where all of the challenges are addressed and corrected to the point where we get to have a father-child relationship with Jesus' dad, God the Father. If we take those two points together, that Jesus is preeminent in creation and in redemption, then we get very close to being able to say that Jesus is the center of everything that the Bible is working towards. Jesus accomplishes and Jesus is the focus of everything the Scripture says. Now that has some implications for us in the 21st century as well as in the 1st century. Jesus' ways become our ambitions. We ad adapt ourselves to his attitude because Jesus is the center. And as we grow closer and closer to him, recognizing his position in creation and in the church, we begin to face his priorities as our priorities. In essence, we let him mold us into his image. Becoming more and more like him. As he becomes more and more the center in our lives as he is in the scripture. Now, that is something that God the Trinity does for us. The, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit enter into our lives in some mysterious way that I can't explain, but they begin to have an influence over our lives. But we as believers have the opportunity to cooperate with Him, to, um, to put ourselves in a position where what He does has more effect. 
And I'm going to give you two of those. They're not the only two, but we're going to focus on two of them today. And then I'm going to give you some hints on how to um, make even those two more effective. The first way we can cooperate is by searching for Jesus in the Scriptures. Uh, I'm, as I've read through the Scriptures, I have more and more been able to identify Jesus' role in almost every passage in the Scripture. That might take a, a little bit of an illustration. Uh, let's, let's take a, an easy one, okay? Let's talk about Joseph. You remember Joseph. He was the 11th son of Jacob one of the patriarchs, and he didn't get along well with his brothers. Uh, Joseph had this tendency to just speak the truth and not care where the consequences led. And he told his brothers how he had had this dream that he was going to be, you know, ruler over them, and they got kind of upset. I, I, I suspect that surprised Joseph. I thought maybe they'd be happy about that. But they weren't. So much so that they sold him as a slave into Egypt. He got bought by a high-ranking Egyptian official, and then his, the owner's wife abused him. I mean, the things she did would have been enough to get some people put on a list in our culture today. Yet he resisted her. And she got mad about that, and she had him thrown in prison. Doesn't look like Joseph is really prospering, does it? Doesn't look like God is protecting him at that point. Now, as we read that just superficially, and that's, that's okay. Sometimes just reading is what the Spirit wants us to do. But as we look a little bit deeper, can we see Jesus in that? Boy, Jesus was in heaven. He had angels to wait on his every desire. And he decided to be born in a barn. And then to live under bridges. He said he didn't even have a pillow to lay his head on. And the people didn't like him, so they crucified him. And buried him. And boy, it didn't look like to other people that he was prospering either. But just like Joseph, who after years in that prison was elevated to the number two position in the entire world. He was Pharaoh's personal assistant. And Pharaoh was the king of the world at the time. Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God our Father and will come someday to be king of the world. Now you might think that I've jumped to that conclusion and it can be done that way. It can be an Ill irrational jump. Uh, so I'm going to give you, during this whole series, I'm going to give you little hints on Bible study techniques. And this is the first one I want to give you. I got this one from a professor, Brian Chappell, uh, who teaches preaching. And he uses the term fallen condition focus. That's a fancy term for what do we have in common with them? And what do the first readers have in common with us? What did Joseph have in common with us? Well, sometimes we can't see God's blessing. How did Jesus fix that? How did Jesus identify with that? Well, he came to a place where no one could see in his life God's blessing. And so now I have found Jesus in that passage. It comes with practice, folks. But look for Jesus in whatever passage you're reading. Another way we can cooperate is to remember Jesus in all of our conduct. As we live our lives, we should be remembering that Jesus is the center. One of the passages that made the most impact on me, one little verse at the end of John chapter 3. And I had been reading that verse in, um, I started reading when I was a kid. I started reading in the Today's English Version. It was the one um, that was sanctioned by the um, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod at the time. So I read that one, and I've read that verse a dozen times or so. And then when I got a little older, somebody gave me an NIV study Bible, and I read that verse, and it never had much of an impact on me. And I read it in the English Standard Version one time, and it jumped off the page and grabbed me by the throat. John 3.36 says, Those who believe in the Son have eternal life. The ESV, it says, 
Those who do not obey the Son will never see life, but the wrath of God remains on them. See, that's, that's God committing full disclosure. He's telling us everything that we need to know instead of just holding for the good parts. The, the key word in that was that word obey because in the other translations, it was always believe. And that caught my attention, so I went and researched it. And I found out that the word for believe in John 3.36 does not occur anywhere else in the Bible. It's the only time it occurs. And that word means to believe in something so much that it changes the way you act. And I thought, wow, this tells me something I didn't know before. And now I know that when, when I'm out in the real world, my conduct needs to recognize Jesus. And again, it's something that grows with practice. Allowing the reality and the supremacy and the preeminence of Jesus to change our behavior. Now those two things, I'm just going to be honest with you, are hard. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes work to see Jesus in every passage. And it takes a little bit of risk because Things will change if we let Jesus be preeminent in our conduct. So I'm going to give you three things that will help for those times when it's extra hard. The first is prayer. I think Bible intake and prayer should instinctively go together. I, I, I just instinctively do this. I'm sure some of you do as well. You read something and you don't know what it means and you go, God, that's confusing. What's that mean? How do I find the answer? And then sometimes when I'm really strong, I just sit there and wait. I try to keep my mind clear. And once in a while, I'll get a direct answer to it. Hey, Mike, you forgot about that other passage. Hey, Mike, you don't really understand that word. Hey, Mike, you're just being stubborn. Sometimes that happens. Not every time, but sometimes. Another, another thing that will help is what is called meditation. Now, I know what some of you just thought of, that, that, that Easter meditation where you sit in an uncomfortable position and you touch your fingers in weird ways and you make those funny noises. You sound like an AM radio. You can't get tuned in. That's not what the Bible talks about when it talks about meditation. Eastern meditation says, empty your mind and let somebody else dump something in it. In Jewish meditation, which is what the, 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 the discipline is based on, the, Greek, the, the Hebrew word actually means to murmur. Talk to yourself about it. Uh, when your hands are busy... And your brain isn't necessarily, for me, it's when I'm mowing the lawn, okay? Uh, for some people, it might be when they're doing dishes. Just think to yourself, now, I read that passage this morning. I read Psalm 20, 23, the 23rd Psalm. And it said, the Lord is my shepherd. You know, I wonder what a shepherd really meant to the people who first read that. You know, I understand that shepherds weren't popular people. They kind of smelled funny, and they weren't considered well-educated, but they were common sense people. And, and then it said something about this, this rod and staff. I understand the rod. That's that thing with the funny hook on the end where they can push the sheep, you know, the direction they want to go so that, so that I won't be in want, and they'll take me to the right pastures. But what's a staff? Isn't that the, the, the thing that... the Jewish men used to walk with so that they didn't lose their balance and fall over? What does that have to do with being a shepherd? I may have to look that up later. I'll bet there's something about that in my study Bible. I'm going to go look at that later. But I wonder what that means today. And to be honest with you, a lot of times you don't come to the answers, but you walk away feeling like you've been in the presence of God. You walk away feeling like you've got that relationship that wasn't there or wasn't as strong before. 
There is one other thing you can do to help the, to help the Lord conform you into the image of Christ and make Jesus center. And that's rely on the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will do things and say things that we can't begin to imagine. I can't tell you the number of times I have read a passage three years ago and I didn't know what it meant, but something happens in my life and suddenly I need to know what that means and it's crystal clear. The Spirit is the one that works in mysterious ways, ways that you can't define and you can't put limits on. But when he does move, we have to cooperate with him and allow him to speak to us and to conform us and empower us to do things that we had no idea we could do. So we can cooperate with the Lord as we try to put Jesus in the center of our lives. And as much effort as it takes, it's worth it. Several things will happen as we make Jesus the center of our lives the way Jesus is the center of Scripture. When we make Jesus the center, we end up seeing things more clearly in our lives and we're assured of clarity in our lives. In areas like our family, you know, in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, there are general principles given Principles about how wives relate to their husbands and how husbands relate to their wives and how parents relate to their kids and how kids relate to their parents. and Even goes so far as to say how employers and employees should relate with each other. They're just general principles. But as you read the passage, the paragraph right before those, it's talking about walking with Christ. And as we walk with Christ... We begin to see how those principles can be played out in our particular circumstances. It's not just in our direct family, it's in our church life as well. Um, Lifeway Christian Research and Gallup uh, did an independent research project where they determined the the primary cause of uh, conflict within the church. And no, it's not the color of the carpets. They both determine independently, and I'm, there's some other resources that have uh, done research as well. They determine that conflict always starts in a church when Jesus stops being the primary purpose of the church. When the glory of God isn't what we're focused on, then we each begin to focus on something separate and begin to have... Or, Originally, very minor conflicts and disagreements that build unity in the church is created when we make Jesus the center. It's maintained when we make Jesus the center. And the the neat thing is, is that's not just for our generation. That's also true of our offspring, our natural offspring, as children see dad sit in front of a Bible and read and pray and grow, that means change over time, they begin to see that God really works. He's active somehow. As we begin to adapt to the centrality of Christ, our grandkids begin to see that my parents are growing, my grandparents are growing. I'm not there yet, but I can grow. And I don't understand everything yet, but I may down the road. Perhaps what I'm saying here is that our testimonies to our children encourage them to make Jesus central in their life as well. But not just our natural kids, our spiritual kids as well. Because as we grow, as we change, as we become adapted to the image of Jesus Christ, not obliterating our temperament and our personality, but adding Jesus to it. As we grow in his image, people around us are going to see. And when we share what helps us with that change, they're going to look at us and say, it seems to be working. They're not perfect. Thank God he never asked us to be perfect or I'd be in big trouble. But he does ask us 
to grow. And other people see it. And other people start the, the growth as well. See, when we follow Jesus, some of the confusion that we have in life gets clarified. Some of the confusion gets identified as not all that significant. Some of the confusion we just accept because we don't have the mind, a mind as big as God's to, to comprehend everything. As we're looking at living by the book, the most important first step is to know the main character. And that main character is Jesus. If anybody in this room has any questions about that, please ask me before you leave today. So that we can hopefully create some clarity and overcome some confusion for you as well. Let's close in prayer. Father, <laughs> it happens all the time. Lord, I, I stand on the platform and I try to speak for you. I try to say the things you've ta taught me and it feels inadequate. Thank you for your spirit's presence and I pray that your spirit will pick up from this point and help us to see Jesus in the Bible, Jesus in every passage of the Bible, to see Jesus in every aspect of our life, to see Jesus as the, the preeminent personage in all of creation, and to allow your spirit to work in us wherever that work may need to be. Father, if somebody has never started that process, I pray that your spirit will convict them of their need for Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior, as their healer and as their King. I pray that they will explore what the Spirit is saying to them so that they can start that process of reconciliation with you, and with the people around them and with themselves to be all that you've called us to be. I ask you in Jesus' name, amen.